Let's take our Bibles. We're in our study of Daniel chapter 9, so go ahead and turn to Daniel chapter 9. And if you would, put a marker there in Daniel. And then turn your Bibles to the Gospel of John. So get in Daniel chapter 9, put your marker there, and then head to the Gospel of John. We'll be there in just a moment. Last Sunday night in the message, I made the comment, the observation, that the older we get, the less that we like change. How many of you find yourself in that category? Okay, quite a few of us are in that category. Perhaps when we were younger, uh, we were all about trying new experiences and doing things that were thrilling and exciting and staying up late and just constantly being on the go. Uh, years ago, I enjoyed roller coasters. Uh, in fact, Troy Hartman and I, r- very first time we ever rode roller coasters was together at Cedar Point. And some of you remember Bob Leathers? He conned us. He told us those were the back seats we were getting into. They were the front seats. We didn't know any better. We'd only ridden, never had ridden a roller coaster before, and that was the closest we'd ever been. Got us in the front seats. Scared us to death. And we rode front seat from there out the rest of the trip to Cedar Point. Now, oh, I ain't getting on a roller coaster. Have you seen the news lately? How many of them are, they're finding cracks and everything else, got stuck going up? Mm -mm, Not doing that. So let's just stay where it's safe and everything. Uh, Maybe you've hit that point in life where you don't want to rock the boat. Excitement for you is watching a documentary on the migratory patterns of humpback whales. Or maybe your favorite show is American Pickers. Now, nothing wrong with American Pickers, but you don't watch it because you're interested in the value of an item. You're interested in it because it's like a trip down memory lane. It's like, oh, I had one of those. I remember that. And it excites you when you see the show. For many of us, if we can just get through the day without having highs and lows and just kind of get through calmly, we consider that a great success. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. That attitude is what keeps us from revival, if you think about it. Too often times we look at our lives as Christians and we will say, well, I don't cuss, I don't drink, I don't gamble, I don't smoke, I don't go to bad movies, um, I don't look at inappropriate pornography and bad websites and stuff like that. I go to church, I read my Bible most every day, Um, I give of my tithes and my offerings, and I even occasionally serve in an office. So we think we've done pretty good. We have the good life. We have a stable life. We're coasting. Coasting is good. It's calm and it's peaceful. If it ain't broke, then why try to fix it? Well, I would suggest to you that that kind of a life really is broke because it's not the kind of life that the Lord wanted for us. Look with me in John's Gospel, chapter 10 and verse 10. John's Gospel, chapter 10 and verse 10. Let's notice what the Lord desires for our lives. It says in verse 10, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life. There's not a period there, there's a comma. And that they might have it more abundantly. So abundant life. Chapter 15 of John, look at verse 11. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you. Is there a period there? No, there's a comma. And that your joy might be full. One more, let's go to the book of Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, the Apostle Paul says, let me get to the right chapter there, there we go, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. Abundant life, full joy, knowing the power. 
does that sound like we're coasting? Does that sound like life is just this stable, no highs and no lows? To have abundant life, full joy, to no power? Man, that thing is moving. That thing has got some excitement. It's got some passion to it. And that's what the Lord wants for our Christian life. That's what revival is about. It's about putting the life back into us because we've gotten so complacent and mediocre. Do we realize that mediocrity is the enemy of greatness and it's the enemy of excitement and it's the enemy of revival? Mediocrity, just, hey, we're coasted. Everything's fine. Let's not rock the boat. Let me tell you something. Revival is going to stir us up. Revival is going to excite our spiritual passions. It deals with mediocrity. And the way that it deals with mediocrity is to deal with sin. To deal with sin in our lives. If you will, let's go back now to where Daniel is at in chapter 9. And this passage of Scripture that we are looking at. Sin is the greatest enemy to revival. It's the greatest enemy to that abundant life to that full joy, to knowing that power. As we look at Daniel and what Daniel has to say here, we are looking at Daniel's confession, and we are looking specifically that Daniel confesses that God keeps His Word. So start with me in Daniel chapter 1, and we're going to go through verse 4. It says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him, and to them that keep His commandments. Last Sunday night, we focused on God's mercy and promise keeping. Let's focus on the last part of Daniel's statement. The last part is to them that love Him and keep His commandments. In the spirit of revival, and when revival is really there, if you was to ask, do you love Jesus? I mean, it would be a fervent yes. But I would dare say that if I asked this morning, how many of us love Jesus? Well, it's Sunday morning, we're in church. What do you expect the answer is going to be? Oh, yes, I love Jesus. But do we? I mean, yeah, to some degree, yes. But that passionate, exciting, full, abundant, powerful, do we have that kind of a description of the love that we have for the Lord Jesus? That might be a little hard to answer. So the Lord's going to give us some ways that we can find out if we really do. And to what extent do we really love the Lord? So let's go to John's Gospel, back to John chapter 14. And this is going to force us to get super honest. Let me tell you something. If revival is going to take place, we have got to get super honest with ourselves. We have got to get super honest with God. And God is going to reveal things to us that, truthfully, we're not going to like very much at first. And He's going to begin to deal with things in our life that we would just have preferred to have left covered up and under the rug. And God says, no. If you're going to have an abundant life and full joy and know my power, these things have got to go. And so in John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 15, the Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Jump over to verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. Let's go to the book of 1 John. Go to 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, how do we know if we really, I mean passionately, love the Lord? First John chapter 2, verse 3, and hereby do we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He that saith, I know Him, and keepeth not His commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. 
But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. Our first test of our love for the Lord is our attitude towards God's word. What is our attitude towards God's word, to God's commands, the things that God tells us to do, and the things that God tells us not to do? Have we ever caught ourselves saying, I sure wish the Lord had not told me I couldn't do that? Or I sure wish the Lord hadn't have told me this is what I have to do? Three times in Psalm 119, David declares his love for God's law. The fourth time, David writes, Great peace have they which love thy law. Remember something, God's word is not just about telling us what not to do. It's also about telling us what we're supposed to do. It's all about us learning the, the, the things that God wants out of our lives. And we may be very quick to say, well, I don't do, and here's the list of the things God said don't do, and I don't do those things. That's great. Those would be sins of commission, things that you have committed against the Word of God. But you know, there's also things God's told us to do. And if we fail to do those, those are the sins of omission. We've omitted the things God has told us to do. Those are equally wrong. We cannot justify and pat ourselves on the back and say, oh, how I love Jesus, because here's the list of the things I don't do in my life that God said don't do. Well, good, pat ourselves on the back and give ourselves a round of applause. What about the things God told us to do? Aren't those equally important? And should we not do what God's told us to do? There's a reason that I'm hitting on this, because in Daniel chapter 9, eight times, Daniel is going to use some form of the word sin. In one chapter, he's going to use some form of the word sin. Two times, he's going to use a form of the word transgression. Three times, he's going to say that we have obeyed not. Do we get the idea, folks, that sin is a big issue in keeping revival from happening? We have got to get rid of the sin that is on our life. You say, well, how do I know what sin? Go to the Word of God. God's Word's going to tell you what is and what isn't. And the things that we shouldn't do, we shouldn't do it. The things that we should do, we better get busy doing it. Because if we're in either category of not obeying God's Word, how in the world then can we sing with fervor, oh, how I love Jesus? Something's not adding up. And God knows our heart. You know, this morning, I was just thinking, when we sang that very first hymn, oh, y'all sounded good this morning. Some Sundays sound really exceptionally good. I don't know what makes the difference. Is it the air temperature, the, the way it carries the sound or what? Other Sundays, I'm like, hmm, that's weak. Not bad, just weak. But today, there was power to it. It's like, wow, that was really nice to hear that. You, what did God hear? What did God hear? All I can hear is with my ears, that's all. But I can't hear the way God hears. God is listening from our heart. And if our heart is clouded with sin, how can we sing songs like, oh, worship the king, when we've got sin in our life? Crowning with many crowns, how? Blessed be the name. Well, we're not blessing his name if we've got sin in our life. We've got to go to the word. God's word's going to tell us. Now, Let's go to 1 John chapter 3. If that's not meddlesome enough, let's let the Lord meddle some more. Because we may get a little ouchy and say, I do what I'm, I'm supposed to do. I don't do what I'm not supposed to do. Okay, let's test this. 1 John 3, 11. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Verse 14. We know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Verse 23, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Chapter 4, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. Verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Verse 20, 
If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Chapter 5. Boy, he meddles all through this book, don't he? Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. See what the Lord does here? He intertwines our salvation with our obedience and love for the word of God. And our, love and, and our love and affection for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's just kind of interwoven together. When we look at these things here, don't raise your hand. Don't nod your head. Don't do anything outward. Let it all be inward and answer the question. Based on this, do you need revival? Do you need revival? Do I need revival? We might get a bit defensive here and say, well, I don't hate anybody. I love the brethren. Okay. But does our attitude towards them show it? Actions speak louder than words. What are the actions saying? When we talk about them in private or in our minds, <laughs> does it show that we love them? If we don't have a love for the brethren, you say, well, I do, 99%. Show me where the Lord let you off the hook on the 1%. Show me the scripture that says, well, I don't have to love that person. They're just a jerk. Boy, they just get under my skin. Oh, they, every time I'm around, they just irritate me. Got somebody in your life like that? The Lord's letting you know you need revival. He's knocking at the door. Answer it. Okay, let's look at another one. Go to Mark's Gospel, chapter 8. By the way, when we love our brothers and sisters in Christ the way that we should, the Scripture says that that love covereth a multitude of sins. We can all be a bit intolerable sometimes, right? Right? Some of you aren't in agreement, but let's ask your spouse. <laughs> Can they be a bit intolerable sometimes? Oh, chickens. <laughs> chickens, bark, 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 I tell you what. We are all a bit intolerable sometimes. But love covereth a multitude of sins. And if we have, our love, have the love for the brethren like we should, and God is working in our hearts. It's amazing who you can love. And it's amazing who you can be nice to. And it's amazing who you can, um, I don't know, just get along with. It's amazing what God can do. But if obedience to His Word, love for the brethren doesn't get us, well, Mark chapter 8, verse 38. Whosoever, therefore, shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. Do we have any hint or shame or embarrassment to talk about the Lord? Does a witness for the Lord roll off of our tongues? When we're with strangers and we know that God's put us with them for some reason, are we praying, Lord, give me an opening. Open a door, Lord. Show me how, show me what to say, show me what not to say. Shut that door, Lord, if it's necessary, but let me be a witness to this person. Do we think that way? Do we pray that way? Looking back at Daniel's prayer, he acknowledges this God who keeps covenant and shows mercy to those who keep His commandments. Albert Barnes wrote this many years ago. He says, God binds Himself to show favor only while we are obedient. And we can plead His covenant only when we are obedient. 
when we confess our sins and plead His promises in this sense, that He has assured us that He will restore and receive us if we are penitent. It was this which Daniel pleaded on this occasion. He could not plead that his people had been obedient and had thus any claims to the divine favor, but he could cast himself and them on the mercy of a covenant-keeping God who would remember his covenant with them if they were penitent and who would pardon graciously. God has the same thing in store for you and I today. If we will deal with the sin that is in our lives and we will let the Lord be very introspective of us. And by the way, this is going to be a constant major theme throughout this chapter. In these short verses, in the prayer that Daniel prayed, we're going to see this repeatedly. You're going to hear this preached repeatedly. Why? Because this is where we get real about wanting revival. You can write a book about it. You can talk about it. You can pray for it. But if you're not willing to deal with sin in your life, Revival's not going to come. It's going to stay at bay. Now let's go to the book of Daniel again and get ready for the next point here. Daniel chapter 9, verse 5. The first three words, but we're only going to focus on one. Daniel says, we have sinned. But it's the first word, we. The third thing that Daniel confesses in this prayer Daniel confesses personal responsibility. We have sinned. He could have said, you guys have sinned. Would he have been right? Well, let's go back to the book of Daniel chapter 1. Let's remember where Daniel is at when this Babylonian captivity all begins. Daniel chapter 1, the first four verses, the Bible says, in the third year of the reign of of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed And of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored, skillful in all wisdom, cunning in knowledge and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. When Daniel comes into the Babylonian captivity, Daniel is called a child. He is not a national leader. He is not a politician. He wasn't making decisions for the nation. He was a kid. So what responsibility does Daniel have for them all being in captivity? And we would say, well, none. He was a kid. What did he do? And yet Daniel prays, we have sinned. It's kind of interesting. Go back one book to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 14. Just back a book, Ezekiel chapter 14. And I want to kind of build up to the point where he claims personal responsibility. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 12. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out mine hand upon it, and will break the staff of the bread thereof, And will send famine upon it, and will cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. The sin of Israel was so deep and so serious that if even three of the most righteous men, and I think this is fantastic, Daniel gets coupled in here with Noah and with Job, If any of these three men were here, if all three of them were here together, they could not deliver the nation from their sins and from the punishment that's come upon them. They could only deliver themselves. So why does Daniel say we? In fact, he continues to say we and us throughout this prayer. What did righteous Daniel do? And the answer is, nothing. And yet, for the sake of revival, 
He identifies himself with the people. He doesn't set himself above them. He sets himself with them. He says it's time to stop blaming. Consider the stages of the opposite of revival in the average church. The stages of the opposite of revival, how does it come about? It'll start out with personal unhappiness and frustration. We don't like something. We get disconnected. We feel disconnected. We get moody. This is all internal, and it begins like a, putting a pot on the water, on a pot of water on the stove, and you just turn it up to simmer. And it just builds a little bit over time. It turns into complaining. It turns into complaining. Think about this. I wonder sometimes if complaining, and I ask myself this, if we don't complain to find out if we're thinking correctly. Am I right to be griped off about this? And what we will do is we will tend to complain to somebody that we think will agree with us, right? We ain't going to complain to somebody that will tell us the truth. That will say, shut up, knock it off. Oh, we ain't going to go to that person. We're going to go to the person and say, yeah, you know what? I've been thinking the same thing. (laughs) Complaining turns into criticizing. This takes complaining to the next level. Criticizing, complaining maybe had a couple of issues. But now it develops into criticizing everything. Nothing's right. Everything is wrong. And so everything begins to get critiqued. Then comes the blaming. Eventually, fault has to be assigned. Now, in the church, you know whose fault it always is, right? Yep, it's the pastor's. But it can also land on the deacons, it can land on the Sunday school teacher, it can land on the youth leaders on Wednesday night, it can land on anybody that's in any kind of a leadership position. And the next thing is a disgruntled exit. Nothing solved, the grass is greener somewhere else, I'll leave, who cares about how destructive my departure is going to be, who cares who it hurts, who who cares about the confusion that it causes. I'm just going to be unhappy, complaining, critical, blaming, and I'm going to take my complaining, critical, blaming self someplace else. And nothing's solved. That's how marriages will disintegrate. It's how people will jump from job to job. It's how a lot of things fall apart in society, in our lives. But is this the Bible way? Is this God's way? Is this Daniel's way? It seems that when you look through the Scriptures, you will find even the innocent, truly innocent, that, like Daniel, that it wasn't his fault that they were in this Babylonian captivity. It was things that happened long before he was even in the womb that had led up to this point. But if we really want revival, and if we really want solutions, our prayer becomes, we have sinned. That's where the change takes place. We have sinned. Let's look at this in some places. Go back to the book of Ezra. The book of Ezra. The book of Ezra, chapter 9. Look at verse 6. In Ezra chapter 9 and verse 6, this is an awesome chapter to study as well. It's Ezra's confession. And it says in Ezra 9 and verse 6, And said, O my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to Thee, my God. For our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespasses our trespasses grown up into the heavens. Notice how he takes ownership of where they're at. Let's go to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1. In Nehemiah, chapter 1, as Nehemiah pours his heart out to the Lord, starting in verse 6, 
It says, let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. One more, Psalm chapter 106. Psalm 106. Psalm 106, verse 4. Psalm 106, verse 4. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor that thou bearest unto thy people. O visit me with thy salvation that I may see the good of thy chosen, that I may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation, that I may glory with thine inheritance. We have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. No blame. Just responsibility. We. If we don't have revival, then we need to take responsibility for it. If we have an issue with somebody, we need to take responsibility for it. If we have got sin in our life, we need to take responsibility for it. It's a we thing, not a, not a you thing. That's blame. Blame solves nothing. One more passage, and let's apply this down to our own nation. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Soon you probably already know the verse we're going to go to. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. The Bible says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Do we all agree that the United States of America needs God's healing touch. Are we a nation that needs healed? America is declining and dying faster and faster every day. Its death is picking up speed. Why is this? If we take 2 Chronicles seven fourteen and work it backwards, we know that we are a nation that needs to be healed. What's caused this? The Bible says sin. Wicked ways. It seems like just when you think that you've seen it all, there's a new low that comes out. And it continues to constantly morph and to get, take different directions. It's, it's crazy. When I was in school, starting in school, you had men's sports and you had girls' sports. And that's the way it was. But while I was in school, you had some girls challenging that they wanted to be in the boys' sports, and a few guys challenging that they wanted to be in the girls' sports. That began to pick up momentum, began to pick up speed. Once those battles are won, now you have transgender guys becoming a part of the swim team, the track team and all those kinds of things and sharing the locker rooms and all that kind of stuff and fighting that battle in court. Everything continues to morph. Where's it going next? Because this isn't the end of it. Where's it going next? Only thing I can figure, and maybe you've got a different take on this, I think we're going to end up coming to a point where there's non-gender sports. Just, eh, if you want to play, just play it. We're not going to worry about what you are, just play it. And, and then, I guess, because we're not, we go along enough generations, you're going to have so many people, they don't even know what they are because they're still trying to figure out what they are. And they've been told, well, you can choose whatever gender you want to be. So I don't know where this thing is going, but we do see it getting worse and worse. Where does this come from? What brought this about? It's being brought about by the people of God 
and their wicked ways. Now, I know we'll get defensive about that. I don't, I don't want anything to do with that. I don't either. But think it through. Would you agree that our world is becoming more and more immoral? Do you agree with that? Who sets the moral compass in the world? Christians? The church? If the church as a whole and Christians individually are not walking with the Lord as, as they should, is that wicked? If Christianity isn't obeying the Word of God and living it as they should, is that wicked? If brothers and sisters in Christ are not loving each other like they should, is that wicked? If we're not evangelizing the lost like we should, is that wicked? If we aren't experiencing revival as God would desire for us, is that wicked? Do you think the church is experiencing revival today? I don't. I don't I know if you think it is, I'd really love to know what your yardstick is that you're measuring it by. But I think the church is in desperate need of revival. I don't know if we wouldn't know what to do if the Holy Spirit of God swept a revival through our family. It would blow us out of the water. So why is our nation where it's at today? It's because the church isn't where it's supposed to be. It's because the believers in Christ aren't where we're supposed to be. We. It doesn't do us a lick of good to say, yeah, you're right, you tell them, preacher. No, I'm telling we. Me. Again, the word wicked may be a turnoff this morning. But isn't sin wickedness? And any sin that violates the Word of God, whether it's a sin of commission or omission, is wicked. So to have revival and to turn things around in a nation, in a church, in our lives, judgment's got to begin at the house of the Lord. Again, 2 Chronicles 7.14, If my people called by my name... The Lord didn't even single out certain ones, did He? He didn't say the Israelites. He didn't say the complainers of the Israelites. He didn't say this group or that group, this tribe or that tribe, if we taking personal responsibility. I told you, revival brings about change. and We might be resistant to it this morning. So I ask you this morning in this invitation, Christian, if we can honestly admit that we are resistant to the changes of revival, if we are resistant to the things that are being presented in God's Word, obedience to Him and love for the brothers and, and evangelizing the lost, if we're resistant to that for some reason, could we at least be honest enough with the Lord to say, here I am, Lord, resistant? Here I am, Lord, and I got my back up against this. Here I am, Lord, and this upsets me. Could we at least tell the Lord honestly that this morning? And then could we honestly ask God, say, Lord, humble my heart for this, because I want revival. We have sinned. You're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior. You, you have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. The Bible tells us very clearly that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have sinned. And you're here without Jesus as your Savior. The Bible says that the wages of sin, your sin is death. Physical death is coming, but that eternal death, spiritual death, eternally separated from God, that's on the horizon. An eternity spent in hell. 
But God loves you. And he paid the price for your sins at Calvary. And you say, oh, but you don't know what I've done. I don't need to. And personally, I don't care what you've done. None of my business. Oh, but it's, it's been a wicked life. You're no more wicked than any fine, upstanding Christian of First Baptist Church, Brian, Ohio. Oh, yes, I am. You just don't know. No. The Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? There is not a one of us in here this morning that came out of the womb righteous. We all came out wicked sinners. You may have expressed your sin differently than others may have expressed it, but you still express the fact you're a sinner, and you know that. But God demonstrated His love for you while you were yet a sinner, and He died for you on a cross. And He shed His blood as the perfect payment of your sin. But that isn't the end of the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus Christ arose from the grave. Jesus is alive. And He wants to give new life to all who will call upon Him to be saved. And lost person today, what we've talked about at the beginning here, that's not for you. You need to be saved. You need to be born again today. Not tonight, not tomorrow, not next week, not next month. Don't put that off. If the conviction of the Holy Ghost is on you right now, and you say, what's that? <laughs> it's what's making you feel miserable right now. It's what's making you say, I need to get saved. I'm not right. That's not the devil telling you that. That is the Lord. So get right this morning. Come to Christ. He ain't going to turn you away. He wants to save your soul today. Take him at his word. Stand with me, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, this morning, you know our hearts. Help us to be able to honestly, before you pray, we have sinned as Christians. Not to cast blame, but to be a part of fixing things. Being a part of revival, first of all, in our own personal life. And when a fire is set, Lord, it's contagious. So I pray this morning, Lord, you'd set me on fire. May that be each and every one of our prayers this morning. And for a lost person that's here this morning that doesn't know you as Savior, today, Lord, today, as you convict them, may this be the day they trust you. And we ask it in Jesus' name.